thank you. If you can take a second to read the um, copyright statement online, you already have the PowerPoint and handout materials that we, we, be, we will be discussing here um, throughout the workshop today. For those face-to-face, -face, the handouts are here, and we will send you the PowerPoint presentation as well. Okay? Everybody good? <laughs> Okay, so this presentation is going to be in two parts. Part one is going to talk about best practices overview. Part two, we'll talk about design, development, and delivery. So in part one, we're going to cover a couple of best practices. We'll start off with seven principles of good practice in undergraduate education. We'll move on to backward design. We'll talk about universal design for learning, UDL. Um, we'll talk about distributed learning quality assurance standards, syllabus best practices, and the syllabus template, as well as the Blackboard online course template. So seven principles of good practice for undergraduate education. These principles can be applied not only in your online environment, but they can be applied in your face-to-face -face environment. So when you take a look at the first two principles, You'll notice that these two principles deal with interactions, the student, the student interaction, as well as the interaction with the instructor and the actual students. So one way instructors can interact with students in an online environment, at the start of the class, you can post a video, a welcome video, giving maybe a course overview. You want to picture yourself in that video so that you become personable with the students and the students can get that immediate connection with you. So can someone give me an example of student to student interactions that can happen in an online environment? This may be a discussion board or where they can discuss about the courses and uh, a topic can be given and they discuss on it and share their expressions and opinions. Okay, so and if you're online, feel free to chat in the chat box. So the first um, one was about doing discussion. So you can have discussions in your online class just like you do in a face-to-face -face environment, except remember they aren't face-to-face, -face, so you have to kind of maybe prompt, give prompts. Um, you want to definitely give credit for doing discussions, so you want to give them a chance to interact with one another. Can someone give me another example? Then you can ask them to introduce themselves to like how the instructor introduced and then make some comments on each other's posts. Yes. So another great thing is to do student introductions. And we'll talk about our quality assurance standards. And that's one of the standards where you have students introduce themselves in the online environment. And so that's a way for them to get to know each other. And instead of just saying, oh, introduce yourself to the class, Kind of give some prompts, um, maybe ask them, you know, what, what their major are, why are they taking this class, what would they like to learn out the class, you know, maybe ask them to share some fun fact that they would like to share with the class. So you want to get them involved. And then you want to use a media, not necessarily, you can use a discussion for that, but you can also do other fun things. Um, you can um, have them do what is called a flip grid. Have anybody heard of flip grid? Um, so if you haven't, if you um, Google flipgrid.com, um, it'll pop up. And what it is is it gives you an opportunity, you and even your students, you can create a flip grid, and the students will video themselves and talk, and um, they can introduce themselves, and then the student will get to see them. And so if it's someone who's shy, who don't want to be on video, then you can still offer another option for them. Maybe they'll do an audio, or maybe they'll do a type introduction. Um, encourage active learning. So just like in your face-to-face -face class, you don't want to just stand up and talk for 50 minutes. You want to have the students interacting with you, throwing out questions, maybe breaking them up into groups. So you want to do that same thing in an online environment. So can anybody think of something maybe you can do in an online environment to um, Let's say if you post a video lecture, what's one way you can get the students engaged with that lecture, for example? Can anybody think of anything? Ask their reflections. OK, a reflection. I mean, it comes to my mind, like, 
my major is tourism. So read the first chapter, we talk about the definitions of tourism. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can ask them to give their own definition and what is their own definition of tourism. Okay, so like he said, if, if he when he does a lecture on tourism, instead of just giving a definition, you can he can ask the students, so what's your definition of? That. Maybe find an error or typo, so maybe you, um, you just put a deliberate typo there. Not too hard, but I used um, this, this strategy. I asked my student, and, if, and I gave them actually one extra credit to read the syllabus and if they can find an error in it. And uh, it worked very well. <laughs> okay, that's definitely one way to get the student to read the syllabus. Yeah. You're going to give them an extra point and say, okay, if you find an error, you purposely put something in there yeah, maybe, for the students. Maybe just uh, like typo in the title of one of the slides or something. Maybe it's, yeah. Right. So, especially in an online environment, because the student isn't in front of you as you give them that information, you can't like look at them and see, oh, do they look puzzled? Are they happy? Are they going to sleep? And then you can't like ask questions to them. So if you decide to post a 20 minute or less video, lecture video, you can always prompt questions. You can either put the questions inside the presentation or after they watch it, you can require them to answer questions so that you know at least they watch that part of the actual lecture. So was it a question online? No, um, some of the responses were voice thread responses and what you mentioned just now posting questions within the PowerPoint that they have to answer. Those are two of the responses from online. Okay, great responses. Um, next, you want to emphasize time on task. Definitely in an online environment, it is, they have to be really motivated, first of all, to even take the class, and then secondly, they have to do good time management. So by setting clear and defined deadlines like you would in your face-to-face -face environment, that's one way to keep them on task. But then you also have to do other things. So normally in a face-to-face -face environment, when they come into class on, let's say, Monday, for example, you may say, oh, don't forget your paper on such and such is due on Friday. So you can give verbal announcements. So in the online environment, you will need to give some type of reminders, announcements, shoot out email messages, because you want to kind of keep them on task. Like at the beginning of the module, the beginning of the week, you want to say something to them in the middle. Then at the end, you want to close it out. So you want to make sure you um, keep them on task. Communicate your high expectations. You want to say set high expectations, but at the same time, you have to make them clear and really clear in the online environment. You want to make sure you're giving detailed instructions Things that you normally would just say verbally in a face-to-face -face class, you now have to like type all of that out so that students know exactly, oh, this is how I can get an A, or this is how I can get that 100 up here, or this is the rubric that, the student, that I need to follow for this particular paper. So rubrics are going to be very important. It's important in the face-to-face -face environment, and it's also important in the online environment as well. Um, diverse talents. Keep in mind that Students in your class are not all the same. Nine times out of 10, they are definitely different. So you don't want to just do the same things for all students and thinking that all students are going to learn. So if you do a video with some other instructional material you can give, maybe you give a reading. So don't do all of the same. They got to read the textbook, the entire textbook. They never see you in a video doing an introduction, talking about a chapter. Um, so you kind of want to vary that information so students, first of all, don't get bored. And secondly, they continue to be engaged in your actual online class. So how many people have heard of backward design? It's been around for a while. If you're online, you can type yes or no. Anybody here heard of backward design? OK, sort of. OK. So, the first step in course design is to define your course outcomes. Normally, those are normally defined before you even get to the point that you want to teach the actual class. So, we're going to talk a little bit in part two more about those learning outcomes. 
and we're going to talk about how those learning outcomes should look. But backward design starts first with the learning course learning outcomes, and then the module unit level outcomes, and then, then it moves on to what do you want the students to know out of your class? How will you measure that? Once you know how you measure that, then you will build your instructional material. It's not about starting with the syllabus first. In fact, um, when I meet with um, instructors one-on-one, -on -one, the syllabus is the last thing in my course design model because you want, don't want to start trying to frame out your syllabus. You know, this is due on Monday and Wednesday. Um, here are um, the assignments that's going to be graded. You want to start with your outcomes first. How are you going to measure those? How do you know the student knows what you want them to know based on your instruction? And then you say, OK, so what do I need to do as an instructor so that the students learn what I need them to learn? OK. Uh, actually, you put outcomes and objectives out of your syllabus because it's a big chunk of my syllabus, as far as I know. A good syllabus has start with outcomes and objectives. Or do you put it like a separate document? No, no, no. It's still going to be in the same document. It's still going to be in your syllabus. Right, right. Your outcomes are definitely a part of that syllabus after your name, course description, your learning outcomes, textbook. So it's still going to fall in there. But when you think about designing your class, and we'll talk about this more in part two, you always want to say, OK, here are my course outcomes. Now, you know, what do I want the students to learn? How will I measure that? And then, oh, how will I give instruction for them to learn? But your syllabus is still going to be a part of that development. It's just not normally starting off with the syllabus in your hand. You got it? <laughs> so next is Universal Design for Learning, or UD UDL. And trying to see if I did a handout. Nope. So um, UDL is basically um, some of the things I have already been talking about, where you want to make your instruction, your assessments, your activities, you want to be give variety in what the students are doing and how you are presenting content to the students. And so the first step in universal design is provide multiple means of engagement. Engagement, this is the why. Why is the student taking this course? Why do you want the student to be engaged? Is the student even motivated? So this is the why. So engagement. Second, provide multiple means of representation. This is the what. And this refers to how you will present your course content. So you want to really think about how you're going to present this, especially if you're converting from a face-to-face -to, -face to an online class or even if you're developing an online class that's never been taught online. You want to think about how will I present this particular material, and then you have to consider, oh, I'm not going to be face-to-face. -face. I'm going to be in an online environment, so what can I do? So a couple of things you can do is you can improve your lecture presentations, like your PowerPoint, if you do that, and kind of vary how you do those presentations. Um, you can. Instead of just scanning a document in, you want to make sure you scan it so that it could be read by an optical reader or recognized um, reader. Then the other thing is, is if you do a video, you can provide a transcript. Um, you can either do the transcript or do closed captions. And then what about if you do a video, how about adding in an audio file so students can listen to it on the go? And the good thing we have is in Blackboard, um, if you're not familiar with it, we have Blackboard Ally. And that will give alternative formats. So if you post something like a PDF, it's going to um, it'll convert it so that it can become a readable PDF. If you post a Word document, it's going to also convert that to other formats. So if you do that actual video, then you can also get an audio file as well. So it'll allow you to do some other formats. So you don't have to create every format. So if you get a chance, just learn about that. And then um, you can always contact support. And I'm going to give you support, some support numbers at the end. Last is provide multiple means of action and expression. This is the how. How will students demonstrate to you 
that they learned what you think they should have learned. And it doesn't always have to be a paper. It definitely does not have to be a midterm final exam. It doesn't necessarily have to be a quiz. It could be other things. You can do stuff like case studies. Um, you can put them into groups to do group projects. You can maybe have them do a lecture for the actual content that you're doing instead of you doing the actual le lecture. You can let students th teach students as well. Um, you can have them do article reviews. So you can do different things that don't have to always be the same standard paper, quiz, exam type of format. Any questions so far? Um, excuse me, what was the name of that tool you said it can convert? It's, it's called Blackboard Ally, A-L-L-Y. Okay. And so um, if you um, use Blackboard now, you may not have noticed, but it's like already in there. So if you uploaded your syllabus in Blackboard, um, you should have seen a down arrow. When you click on that down arrow, that's alternative formats, and it'll show you the other formats that are available. And so the students will see that same down arrow, and they can choose what format they want. Because if it's a Word document, the student can have it read it to them. So it's, it's mainly um, for accessibility and universal design. Any other questions? Is it possible that Blackboard reads for them? Like if you think that it's Blackboard, does it? Well, it'll allow them to download a file. So it'll download a readable file, and then they can play it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So now we're on the University Quality Assurance Standards, and you should see this document online, and it's also on your table as well. So these are the, I hope I gave it to you, did I? Okay, great. <laughs> so these are the um, standards that we use for online and blended courses, and it's based on what is known as the Quality Matters um, Higher Education Rubric. And so these standards um, is nine main general standards, and then there's several um, standards underneath each one. So this is how you can evaluate your course, measure your course, and as you're designing your actual class online, these are the different standards that you want to um, go by. So if you take a look um, at the slide, I have some that are um, in a different color. So learning outcomes and objectives, assessment and measurement, instructional materials, learning activities, and student interaction, and course technology. These uh, main standards work together to go back to and tie back to your learning outcomes and your module level learning objectives. So when these are in line with one another, it means that your course is in what we call alignment. And so that way you would give your students the best learning experience possible. So, for example, if you have a learning outcome, um, trying to think of a quick one, <laughs> explain how to write a paper. Just throwing it out there. So you want them to learn about the different parts of a paper. Introduction, the body, conclusion. So if that's one of your learning outcomes, then something in assessments, they're going to have to do some type of writing. You know, you're not going to say, oh, videotape yourself baking a cake. OK, so you want to make sure that it's in alignment. And that's kind of elaborate. I'm kind of throwing out two extremes. But sometimes your course outcomes and what you want the student to show you that they know may not match up. So just kind of make sure that those match up as well. And um, at the CTE, we can provide you, or uh, we have provided online what is called a syllabus template. So there are some syllabus best practices, and um, you'll get the slide, but if you just visit our main website and you go to teaching resources, you can find the different um, templates that we have available. So these templates are already designed, um, especially the blended and the online are already designed to meet all of these quality assurance standards to help you meet those standards. Um, so if you, it talks about in the standards, 
where you need to introduce yourself. Of course, you're going to give your name and stuff in your syllabus. It talks about identifying and describing the different assignments that the students need to complete. So um, the syllabus is available to you online. And I strongly recommend downloading it and just copying and pasting your information into the actual template. Remember, you can always move out stuff that you don't need, add in stuff that you do need, but it'll be in line with everything that a syllabus um, should have. Another um, resource that we have is what we call a Blackboard online course template. And this template, um, if you're interested in having a template before you design your um, actual course, which I definitely recommend, you can contact CTE and one of the instructional designers can set you up a what we call a sandbox course with no students. And we'll put this actual layout here. But if you take a quick look at it on the left hand side of the menu, it's going to hit all the main things that you um, should have in your course design. And you'll also see in this section learning modules. So in an online environment, instead of just throwing everything out there into one, I'm going to call it a folder, um, you want to break up things. So in your face-to-face -face class, you may talk about unit one. So why not just create a unit one module? You may group units one through three together and give it a name. So you want to chunk your information um, in your online environment like you probably would in your face-to-face -face environment as well. Any questions on anything we covered in part one? Question. I have a question. What's a reasonable amount of time to expect students to spend on modules or course material per week? Roughly about four to six hours. Okay. That sound about right to you, Aisha? Yeah, I know that the committee on instructional development um, wants to see about. Well, I guess it's 63, 300 hours for the whole, 63, 300 minutes, minutes for the whole course, which kind of break down to about nine hours per week. Yeah. And another question about the length of lectures. Like, in a, do you have any recommendations? Like, say, 50 minutes videos are enough, or like 20 minutes videos, any uh, gold standards, any like, what okay. Yeah. So, um, on the quality assurance standards, videos should not be longer than 20 minutes. No longer than 20 minutes. Do not have to be 20 minutes. I recommend five, 10 minutes. Remember, you can always break that up. Do one 10 minute video, five 10 minute video, have them do something. Then let them watch another five to 10 minute video. So don't think you have to do a whole 50 minute lecture, record 50 minutes for the student to watch. First of all, they're not going to watch it and it's not going to meet the standards, but you want to break up the content so that students, I mean, they're not going to sit there and watch it and kind of, you know, think about yourself, you know, as material you're learning, it's not a movie that you're really interested in watching. So it's something that, oh, I have to watch this lecture. So you want to kind of have them engaged in it. So when you break it up and you make it short, they're like, oh, good, I can watch this three minutes. Oh, I'm good. And then they're more likely to watch it. And if they open it up and it says 50 minutes, they then close it back and then it moved on. <laughs> and then they're going to try to go through the video at another time and say, oh, let me see if I can answer this question. Oh, let me write this down. So they're going to Miss out on important stuff that you want them to learn. Even 15 minutes is too long, right? Maybe 15? Five, yeah. Three, five minutes is okay. Right. You can do 15 is good, but no longer than 20. Yeah. 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 So just find a breaking point in the content that you want to talk about and just break at that good point. So if the good point is at five minutes, then it's at five minutes. If the good point is at 15, okay, you're still within 20 minutes. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so we are in part two, design development and delivery. So we're gonna talk about um, course learning outcomes and objectives. We'll dive a little deeper into that for a little, a couple of minutes. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Blackboard Learning Management System, not how to, but just I'm gonna show you a couple of things um, as far as design 
and development, and then we'll talk about communication and feedback as a part of the actual course delivery. So I gave you a copy of the revised Bloom's taxonomy verbs. I recommend taping this next to your desk, wherever you work. Um, I like to keep this handy because it's just some verbs, and these are just example action verbs, but it's a quick list. When you're looking for a word that you're trying to replace, let's say your um, learning outcome says, understand how to write using the MLA format. Understand. Is that really an action verb? Can I really know that the student understands? So what's some other word I can use? So you can quickly go to this list and you can say, oh, explain, define, you know, demonstrate. So you can thought you um, have this in your hand so you can quickly reference that. So each learning outcome is represented, of course, by a sentence. And if you take a look at these um, outcomes and objectives, you'll notice that they each start with an action verb. Um, and then you'll see it's followed by other content. So describe the history and operation of the different correctional institutions. Okay. So and. Learning objective, which is a smaller piece of the main outcome, could be defined corrections as a criminal justice institute. So you want to make sure that when you're writing your learning objectives, that you're keeping in mind that they should be student-centered. It's not about what you're teaching, but it's about the student. What should the student know after they take your class? <laughs> so what should the student know? <laughs> as a result of your instruction. So I'm not going to give instruction that I don't expect the students to learn anything from. OK? So did anybody happen to bring their learning outcomes or a copy of their syllabus with them for our hands-on activity? OK, everybody looking at me like, no, I did not. OK. So basically on your online or on your table, there is what is called a module learning objectives worksheet. So your homework assignment is to take a look at your course outcomes. And you're going to ask yourself three questions. Does the outcome start with an action verb? If it doesn't, rewrite it. Is the outcome measurable? If it is not measurable, then rewrite it. Does the outcome contain observable behavior? Is it something that I can observe that I know the student learned what I needed them to learn based on this particular content? OK? So I'm going to throw out um, a learning a course learning outcome, and I want you to tell me if you think it is measurable, if it starts with an action verb, and if it contains an observable behavior. Okay, so here's one. Demonstrate an understanding of the MLA format. Demonstrate an understanding of the MLA format. Y'all saying yes to all of those? Yeah. OK, so let's take a look at it. Demonstrate. Definitely an action verb. Can't argue with that. The next part, an understanding of. Can I measure understanding? Just the word by itself, understanding. Can I measure understanding? Somebody tell me, how can you measure understanding? Just survey, just yes, no, on a scale of micro scale. They rate themselves. Or you can just have MLA format and have them identify each piece and tell you. Right, so you identify actions that they can do, but the word understanding is not measurable in itself. Okay, by itself, the word understanding is not measurable. 
So demonstrate is an action verb. Understand, understanding of is not. So a lot of learning outcomes and objectives may start with demonstrate and understanding of. Boom, it's killed. Got to rewrite it. A lot of them start with understand, understand, da, da, da. Understand. How, how can I understand? I mean, I can say I understand, but can you measure that I understand? I mean, yes, you can give me a test and I can pass the test, but by itself, it is not measurable. So demonstrate an understanding of the MLA format could be rewritten. You can simply say demonstrate the MLA format if you want to, to make it simple, but you can even get further into that. It just depends on how much of that MLA format you're focusing on in your class. Okay, um, and then understand the, understand the MLA format. Of course, you can't understand that. You can measure, but how can you by itself the word understand? So if I say demonstrate, then that's action. They got to do something. If I say understand by itself, it's not measurable. Okay, so I just went back to this slide that just shows um, some objectives. So when you get a chance, take a look at your objectives. Um, and I will throw it out there. There are a lot of courses from the university that do not have measurable, <laughs> obtainable, starting with an action verb, learning outcomes, course level outcomes. So I charge you with this. If your course learning outcomes are mandated, which means by the department, even by the university. I challenge you to rewrite those and present those to your department heads, um, your deans, to let them know that you know this is a is a university quality assurance standard that they should be measurable and attainable. Okay. Any questions on outcomes and objectives? Okay, so moving on to Blackboard Learning Management System. Before you put anything in Blackboard, I urge you to first put it on paper. Put it on the computer. So, before you hit Blackboard, first thing you're going to do when you decide you want to teach a course, could be face-to-face, -face, but we're talking about online, is you want to lay out your class in Microsoft Word, for example, or if you want to write it out on paper. So remember, you're going to set out your outcomes, okay? Here are my outcomes. These are the assessments. Oh, from the assessments, here are the instructional materials, and then, oh, here are the activities as well to go along with that. And then everything is going to be laid out, and um, we normally recommend some type of document that you see here, because when you think about your modules, so you look at the class as a whole, and then you decide how you're going to break it up. Normally, it's weekly. Um, it could be by units. It could be by chapters. Um, it could be by topic. But then each module is going to not only have a module topic, it's going to have an overview, what's going to happen in that module, a learning objective, and it's going to have a to-do list. So those learning objectives should be smaller objectives based upon the outcome of the entire class. So you don't have to necessarily put your, and put them in order, like A, B, C, D, but you just make sure you cover them all, okay? And then within each module, you wanna also give the information that the students need, like information for assignments. It's online, so of course they're gonna submit their assignments online, so you're gonna give details. Um, you're going to provide rubrics or some type of grading scale so students know how they're going to be graded. If they have to read something, so they have to read chapter one. So go ahead and, and put that in Blackboard, read chapter one, and just cite the book. Don't assume that they're going to read that to-do list and they're going to remember, oh, are they going to go back to read the chapter? But if you lay everything out that they need to do within that one location, the student comes into module one, at the beginning of module one, they can stay in module one and they can do everything they need to do. Watch your lecture, they can do readings, they can take quizzes, 
And then at the end of that module, they're ready to move on to module two. So you don't want to have your stuff scattered out. You know, you're talking about your to-do list in the module, but then you want them to click on assignments over here to find the assignment for the right module. And you're assuming they're going to find the right one, and then they're going to submit to that. So you want to kind of make sure. But all of this is like done outside of Blackboard. This is actually a Word document. And then the good thing is you can copy and paste it into the Blackboard environment. So it won't be lost because you decided to plan ahead and design outside of Blackboard. You can copy and paste it. Any questions so far? So the last thing on delivery is communication and feedback. You definitely want to plan ahead. Um, I always recommend setting aside time when you're going to grade assignments, setting aside time how you're going to communicate with your student. So you want to set up what is called a communication plan. You know, at the beginning of the module, I'm going to um, post an introduction. Maybe I'm going to do an outro, like I'm going to give, tell them what they learned in the previous module. I'm also going to send a reminder email on, let's say the class goes from Monday through Sunday. So on Monday, I'm doing this introduction. On Wednesday, I'm sending some kind of something. Oh, I see that you've been participating in the discussion board. Oh, it looks great. Da, da, da. Or I'm going to remind them about something. At the last day of the module, I need to wrap up and say, okay, you know, the module closes on tomorrow, da, 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 make sure you have already done. And then in, as part of that communication, if you see that students haven't been doing something in the class, shoot them an email, you know, and say, okay, I noticed that um, the discussion board was due on Tuesday, but you have, it's Friday and you haven't done anything, just checking in with you. Want to know if you have any questions. So you want to make sure that you communicate. Don't um, wait on the students to come to you, but put it all out there. And then some of this stuff may not apply to some students. You may have those students who, I mean, they do everything ahead of time. They, I mean, they just on point. But then it will help the students who aren't on point stay on point. And so one way to do communications is an announcement. Um, this is a text. I mean, a typed module five outro, module six intro. So normally at the end of a particular module, I like to either do a video, um, type an announcement, maybe do an audio. So I like to kind of give them different things. So one, one module, they may see me talking about what we discussed. Another module, they may just read. Another module, they may hear me talking. And then keep in mind, if it's audio or video, you have to either do um, captions or transcriptions. But you want to give them something to read other than what's already in there. Um, and then feedback, for example, um, this is from our Getting Started Teaching Online um, short course that we offer here at CTE. Just put, putting in a plug for that. We will be offering, we offering one for the spring, but that's already started. This summer, we will also be offering the Getting Started Teaching Online course as well. But um, as, part of fee, um, as part of one of the assignments, they have to write out, they have to send me a document that shows their learning outcomes and their module level objectives. And then I take a look at them and I provide feedback. So here's one that said, understand the expectations of the online course. Understand the writing, understand the components of reflective writing. So I kind of you know, let them know why it's not measurable. And then I actually attach the document um, that talked about learning outcomes and objectives. So if it's some content that you already referenced in a module, just tell them refer back to so that the student will know, oh, let me go back or uh, refer back to the rubric. Oh, I better look at the rubric and see why, you know, then that way before they come to you, they like, oh, she did tell me, oh, yeah, this was in the rubric. I missed it. So they kind of, and then they kinda, it's a learning experience for them because you not only want them to learn content, you want them to learn time management. I mean, you want them to just learn life skills too. You want them to you know, be able to take feedback and then adjust whatever they need to adjust to meet the next standard that you have set for them. Uh-oh. OK, so we have about seven minutes.
about 10 minutes. Any questions on anything I cover? Okay. So you mentioned that uh, you can engage students by giving them projects. So in the online course, what type of projects can be useful for engaging this kid? It depends on the content, uh, the class. So let's say it's an English class, um, and they have to write an essay. So you can do peer reviews. Um, you can group them into two students, or you can group them into three or four students, and you can have them read each other's paper, give them prompts on how to do the peer review, um, and give feedback. And then the students in their group online because you want to break that up, maybe five students at the most. And then they can discuss it and they can share. And then the next, when they modify their essay, then hopefully it's improved the next time. So that's one way. Um, case studies, you can do um, case studies online. Um, you can present them with a case. You can break them up into groups. And your groups, they don't have to be grouped and do discussions, but they can use other media. I mean, other social media, or they can use whatever you would like them to use. Um, don't just don't think you just have to be limited to what's in Blackboard. Any other questions? Okay. Um, the last handout that's on your table or online up oh, handout is the one that says my course delivery plan. So this is another document that you can reference. Um, and like I said, you definitely, not only are you designing the course content, material, activities, assessments, but you need a plan for how you're going to deliver this class. You know, what am I going to do? When am I going to provide feedback? Because it's going to be a time management issue for you too, <laughs> just like it is with the students. So if you know, okay, I will set the stage in my class by creating an introduction video, and then, you know, you do it. So you want to plan out what you want to do, how you're going to support the students learning. Like I said, you're going to send them reminders, send emails if they haven't participated. And then I plan on managing my course and time by. And I always like to set up if it's a Monday through Sunday class, and then so I'm going to have, let's say, assignments due on Sunday, then on Monday, I may set aside three hours, however many hours I figure it may take me to grade those assignments. Um, and then, like, if it's discussion boards, um, depending, you want the students to kind of discuss, and you want to kind of stay in the background, but at the same time, you want them to know you present. So it depends on if it's a large or small class. You want to decide how you're going to facilitate those discussions. Um, if it's large, you may only... Um, discuss or participate in discussions for people A through F in one module. Maybe you'll go G through whatever in the next module. You kind of break it up so that everybody at least hear, hears something from you. The other thing is if it's a large class, at the, you can just do a recap, discussion recap, and just pull out the main points. And then try not to pull the main points from the same students every time. Maybe you pull a point from so-and-so. And you can just say, oh, this student, you know, gave us a great idea about tourism. You know, when you take a tour to Paris, they recommend you do this. So you can kind of recap the things like that. So these are documents. Um, like I said, we will email you since you are face-to-face -face and give you the documents. And I strongly do recommend that. The other thing I do recommend is coming to visit us, the instructional designers. Um, for us to help assist you as you design, develop, and deliver your actual class. And it doesn't necessarily have to be online. It could be blended, hybrid, or it could be face-to-face -face as well. The Office of Distributed Learning is another resource for you. Um, they have a recording studio. Nice setup. They have a couple of them. Nice setup. High-grade material. I mean, um, equipment and you can go in there and you can record and they even have students who can do the transcriptions for you um they can do captions so it'll help make your job easier and again it is professional where is it it is um 
you know where the old business school, well, I guess I keep calling it the old business school, but the <laughs> um, over um, is right across from that. Dollamore? It's across from, not Dollamore, the old Dollamore. <laughs> It's close hip building. Close hip building. Thank you. I couldn't think of the name of the building. It's on College Street. College Street. Yeah. Isn't one of those houses? It's hospitality now. It's not. It's no. It's probably like a cross the street. See, from, from that building. Yeah. 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 Yeah.